Hey, I'm Dr. Morales and in this video I'm going to discuss how AFib is actually diagnosed. So if you're having these uh, symptoms of your, of, in your heart um, and you don't know if it's AFib and you want to figure out how to figure out what it is or, or what it's not, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about in this video. Or maybe you're a, a student or you're somewhere, someone working in the healthcare field and you want to understand better about how AFib is diagnosed. And so again, I'm going to discuss about this in this in this video. I'm going to talk about some of the symptoms. I'm going to talk about all the different things that are not AFib that can cause similar symptoms as well as how AFib itself is, is diagnosed. So um, let's talk about what are symptoms of AFib? Uh, AFib most commonly is a feeling of a sudden onset of fast beating heartbeat. You know, so your heart rate will be nice and steady, going at a nice normal pace, like 60 to 70 beats per minute, and then all of a sudden, shoom, your heart rate will go shooting up and maybe going somewhere around 120 to 150, sometimes even as high as 180 or 200 uh, beats per, per minute. So it just all of a sudden boom goes really fast and a afib is usually something that kind of goes on rapidly and off uh, rapidly kind of like a, a light switch and so it'll be boom real fast and all of a sudden boom it, it stops and it goes uh, back down to normal and the duration of these symptoms can be very uh, variable i mean some people may just have a few seconds a couple minutes sometimes they last a couple of hour hours even uh, and so a sudden onset of rapid heart rate is, is probably the most common feeling that people have um, but not everybody fe feels that way though sometimes people just feel like kind of a, a skipping feeling like it's, sometimes it's described as a fish flopping type of feeling and the heart just kind of feels like it's all, all over the place but they don't necessarily feel that it's going fast uh, heart skipping can certainly be an, an, another reason for, for that there are some people who just kind of feel dizzy or lightheaded or short of breath and don't necessarily feel anything directly in their in their heart itself okay so those are the most common symptoms again most commonly it's a sudden onset of a, of a rapid heart rate will be the most common feeling that that people have um, but first let's talk about what can cause these types of symptoms that are not AFib but then I'll talk a little bit more how AFib itself is diagnosed and so many things can cause these types of symptoms first things would be just extra beats. Uh, extra beats can certainly cause a, a skipping feeling. There's extra beats that can come from the top portion of your heart, which are called premature atrial contractions or PACs, or extra beats that come from the bottom chamber of your heart, which are called premature ventricular contractions or PVCs are the, the common term. Uh, these types of extra beats can feel very similar. Uh, they can kind of feel like a skipping type of feeling. They're usually not described as a racing feeling. It just kind of feels like a skipping feeling. Uh, when people are having that, uh, most people will feel that kind of skipping or fish, fish flopping see, uh, feeling. Um, but uh, sometimes people have other symptoms and they just feel kind of short of breath, dizzy. I've had a few people who actually feel chest pain when they're having a lot of these uh, extra beats in a row. But it's usually not described as racing feeling if they're just having extra beats of the heart. So that's one thing that can cause it. Uh, other things that, what, but what can actually make your heart go fast and have symptoms similar to a fib? Uh, one would just be your natural heartbeat. You know, your natural heartbeat, which is called sinus rhythm, it starts from the upper chambers of your heart. There's a nice uniform uh, P wave in, the, in, your, in your EKG, which shows that the upper chambers are beating together in contraction. Um, that can certainly go fast and times in inappropriate manners. So obviously, when you're exercising or doing activity, your heart rate naturally goes fast. But there are times when it's going faster than it should or it's going fast in an inappropriate uh, manner or, or more exaggerated than it really should. And that can be something that's called inappropriate sinus tachycardia. Um, and it just means that it's going, it's your natural heartbeat going fast, but going faster or more exaggerated than it really should uh, naturally do. So that is always a possibility of a, why a person's heart rate go, goes fast. Um, another thing that can make a person's heart go fast is what's called an SVT or, or called supraventricular tachycardia. Supraventricular tachycardia is a short circuit rhythm, uh, usually most commonly comes from the middle portion of your heart, which makes your heart go very fast, usually around 150 beats per minute. Um, it's usually similar to AFib with a rapid on and, and a rapid off. Uh, it looks a little bit different from AFib on the EKG and that's how your doctor can tell the difference between what, what is causing and what is the difference between AFib and, or this SVT. In addition, there's some age uh, demographics for these types of problems as well. You know, SVTs are usually more common in people who are younger. So if you are in your 20s or 30s or even a teenager and you're getting these fast heart rate episodes, 
um, statistically speaking, uh, it's more likely to be an SVT because that's what more commonly happens to younger people. I uh, can't say I haven't had young people with AFib. I certainly have had a few patients with AFib who are in their 20s and 30s, uh, but statistically speaking, SVT would be a lot more common in a younger population. Now, if you're older, 50s, 60s, AFib is a lot more common. So statistically speaking, it'd be more likely to be AFib than SVT. There's another arrhythmia called atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is kind of like AFib, except it's a little bit more regular. The heart rate does go fast. It is a abnormal heart rhythm where the heart is going fast in the upper chambers of, of your heart. And it, it, it usually goes anywhere from 120s to one, uh, 150 be beats per minute. Uh, also increases the risk of stroke. Uh, it's very similar to AFib. I usually tell patients that it's a cousin of, of atrial fibrillation. So first, uh, let's talk about the next. Let's talk about the 12 lead EKGs in terms of what is the difference between some of these fast heartbeats in terms of how your doctor really can tell the difference between the two. And the 12 lead EKG, which is you get usually in a doctor's office or in an emergency room, is definitely the gold standard in terms of knowing exactly what it is and what's causing the uh, the, abnormal, the abnormality or your symptoms that you're having. Uh, but there's also a lot of different options, which I'll talk about next. So out of 12 lead EKG, let's first talk about AFib and how is AFib diagnosed. In AFib, the atria or the upper chambers of your heart, they're not squeezing together in unison like a normal heartbeat. The atria are just rapidly beating all over the place. It's almost as if it's quivering, okay? And so that uniform P wave, which is the together uh, contraction of the upper chambers of your heart, is replaced by this squiggly line in your, in your EKG. And that squiggly line is your upper chambers of your heart just fibrillating. Instead of squeezing together like this, it's just kind of quivering all over the place. And that's what it looks, it looks like a squiggly line on, on the bottom of, of your EKG. And I'll show some example pictures here while, while I'm talking. Uh, in addition, during AFib, the heartbeat can be very irregular, meaning there's not a steady uh, space and speed between each heartbeat. So you have the actual heartbeat, the bottom chamber of your heart is the QRS complex, which is a little spike that comes up in, on, uh, on the EKG. That's your, the actual heartbeat that comes from the bottom. So in AFib, that time between each beat and beat will be very irregular, will not be consistent throughout that uh, the EKG tracing. And so those are the main ways in which an EKG can tell you that a person has atrial fibrillation. Other types of rhythm just look different. Um, SVT, for example, is usually very fast. Uh, there's, you also don't see a, any type of regular P wave activity usually uh, because it's usually buried inside of the, the QRS, uh, but it's, it looks very regular. It's fast, but it's consistently speed throughout the whole strip. Uh, when a, atrial flutter is something that actually looks kind of like a, a, a line that goes up and down. That's, instead of having a squiggly line, it looks described as a sawtooth pattern, and basically that pattern goes up and down, up and down, up and down, and that's the, the atrial beat going very fast, but it's going in a repetitive uh, fashion, and atrial flutter can look uh, regular as well. Lastly, that was I mentioned sinus tachycardia. Uh, sinus tachycardia also can make your heart go fast, but in sinus tachycardia, you're going to see that P wave right before the QRS and almost at every beat, so you'll know that it's a natural heartbeat go, just going faster than it should be. So that's the gold standard. That's sort of how uh, diagnosed uh, AFib is in the gold standard kind of way, but that can be quite challenging to, to do. Um, why is that? Well, when most people, when they have AFib, especially in the earlier stages, when you're first trying to figure out whether you have it or not, you're not in AFib all the time. And so if you do an EKG or you're doing a test in your heart when you're not having AFib, it looks perfectly normal. I've had countless patients come to me and tell me like, I've been having these symptoms for years and nobody could figure it out. Nobody could actually catch it. Uh, and then you didn't know that they were having AFib because that is the tricky part, you know, to diagnose somebody with AFib is to actually catch it while it's happening. Because if you're not if you're feeling normal, chances are the tests are going to be normal. Um, so what are ways in which your doctor can uh, test or detect for uh, atrial fibrillation? So there's several external heart monitors. Um, they all have different durations of time in which the battery is good for. You know, when I talk to a patient and I say they're coming to me with some irregular heartbeat or fast heartbeat problems, you know, my the type of monitor I usually offer them will just factor in how often are they feeling the symptoms. So that's one of the first things that I ask my, pa my patients is how often are you feeling your symptoms? Because if they're feeling something every day, well then usually a monitor for a day or a couple of days will probably catch the, the problem, whether it's an irregular heartbeat, fast heartbeat, AFib, 
you know, these external heart monitors, usually they put a couple of patches on your skin and a clip on your belt. There's also some newer uh, heart monitors which are very, just one single patch that goes right over your heart. Uh, and they can record for you know a day or, or a couple of days, and usually that might be uh, sufficient information to know what's happening at the moment in time when a patient's having symptoms. But the patient has to have, be having frequent symptoms, you know, every day or every uh, couple of days for that type of monitor. Some patients say they have something once or twice a week, you know, and so you need longer duration monitoring, you know, at least of one week, sometimes even a couple of weeks. You know, some of these external monitors may go up to four weeks um, to, to figure out what it is that is a person is experiencing depending on what the frequency is you know so if somebody's having something once a week once every two weeks you know I would probably do a monitor that will go for at least a duration for a few weeks um, obviously when you have something on for a few weeks it only works while you're wearing it um, you know, some people they take it off when they take a shower uh, they put it back on uh, some of these other newer ones can you can actually still take a, sh a shower with it and it still still be good for a, a week or two but if you take it off you, you got to put it back on after you finish a, a taking a shower because it only records obviously when you're actually wearing uh, the device um, what about symptoms that are very far apart you know what if somebody gets these severe episodes and they are months apart you know every six months you get a very severe episode of heart racing uh, that can be very difficult to to catch uh, because it's such a long duration between ha having episodes and frankly the patients don't really know when it's going to happen you know you don't know if it's going to happen next week or six months from now or maybe even a, a year from now uh, but there are some good options for, uh, for that uh, one of the ones that is offered in your doctor's office is uh, what's called an implantable cardiac device, also sometimes called a loop recorder. This is actually a device that goes underneath your skin. It's a heart monitor, kind of like the heart monitors that you wear on top of your skin, except it's inside of your, your skin uh, and you don't have to wear anything. You just go about, about, about your life and the device is always recording your heart rate. The devices themselves, they're about the size of a, a paper clip, uh, slightly skinnier uh, than that and a little bit thicker, but that's probably a good reference to imagine the size of these devices. Just goes right underneath your skin like that. You get a cut smaller than a fingertip and the device goes right underneath your skin or right above your heart, just like that. Usually it only takes about a few minutes to put in. These devices are actually have batteries that are good for about three to four years and so it's always record, recording your, uh, your heart and it will tell your doctor exactly what's happening. So for people who have episodes far apart, you know, uh, so that maybe three months, six months, a year between severe episodes, these can be a good options just for something that is recording your heart for several years and can tell your doctor if you're having episodes of AFib. But uh, fortunately these days there's actually a lot of at-home devices that can also be helpful and you may not need to have something inside your inside your skin. Uh, obviously the ones underneath your skin are extremely accurate, they're excellent devices, um, these loop recorders, but there's also things that you can have at home uh, that can be helpful for you. One of my favorite devices for recording uh, symptoms at home is the CardioMobile, which I have an example of one right here. This is actually the CardioMobile 6L. Uh, when someone's having symptoms, uh, they just put their fingers on their device and there's actually a bottom sensor right here as well you put your leg over there and it records your heartbeat in six uh, different angles and this is a device that you just buy on your own it's yours to keep you know the battery is good for uh, several years and then it can be re replaced up after that uh, and there's nothing in inside your body um, and this is probably my preferred and most recommended uh, heart monitor for people who either have AFib or unexplained symptoms and nothing seems to be able to catch it. So this would be something that you would just kind of keep on you, uh, you know, keep it in your purse, keep it in your, in your wallet, in your pockets. And if you get a symptoms, you can you go ahead and initiate a tracing and then the tracing actually goes saved on your phone. And then you can show your doctor what happened when you were actually feeling something. These have been very good and it's very accurate, especially this one, the six lead one, you know, the more angles you can see of your heart, the more uh, accurate it is. You know, people always ask, well, how did it do six leads? Well, you know, you, ha you understand that there's three sensors here, but this each sensor measures electrical activity in both directions. So if you have your thumbs like this, it's measuring angles this way and that way from right to left. So that's two. And then also two form from here to here and only from here to here. So they each go in both directions. And so that ends up adding to six to kind of give you an easy uh, uh, idea of how it measures it in six different different angles. But there's other options as well. You know, the uh, Apple Watch also does this as well. Uh, the, the Apple Watch has been around uh, a few years now. Uh, it's been in a couple of generations. It's actually definitely getting better as more generations uh, come out. The Apple Watch, the nice thing about it is that 
you're, you're wearing it. Uh, you know, you're wearing it all the time. Uh, it's not recording an EKG all the time, but it does give alerts. It's recording, like, it's looking at your heart rate all the time. And so if you have a fast heart rate, you might start seeing alerts for a fast heart rate, and then you can initiate the EKG um, yourself through the uh, through the Apple Watch itself. And so it's definitely been a very good option. These days, there's also a Fitbit also came out with a, with the EKG product. Uh, and but there's all and there's also a few other products as well and there's constantly new companies trying to come out with these types of equipment for harmonic rate fit because more there's more and more people are, are getting a, a fit these days so these products are getting very 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 good but the still the cardio mobile is actually still my favorite and the one that I recommend the most because I think it works the best of all these at home monitors that you can buy and just keep on your own so it's been a, definitely a, a excellent uh, option for a lot of people so if you're it, uh, you know there's a lot of ways to treat these symptoms as well you know there's a lot of ways to improve symptoms of AFib uh, there's medications there's procedure there's also natural treatment op options as well lifestyle modifications are absolutely crucial to reduce symptoms of AFib as well as reduce your re reliance on medications or even procedures which is why I created the take control over AFib program the take control over AFib program gives you the step by step plan on everything you need to improve symptoms of AFib naturally uh, help you to lose weight reduce inflammation uh, so reduce alcohol consumption reduce added sugar artificial ingredients everything you need is right there in one place and there's a link for it right underneath this video so go ahead and click the link of this video and it'll take you over to my website where you'll learn more about the program you'll learn more about what's included as well as see testimonial videos of people who have actually taken the program and see what they have to say but go ahead and, and take a look at, the, at my program see if that might be the right thing for you. I really hope that you enjoyed your vi this video and understand a little bit more about how AFib is diagnosed. And otherwise, I wish you the best with your AFib symptoms.